This video is sponsored by Shortform. They provide in-depth book summaries, including personal favorites of mine, like The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius and Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicolas Taleb. Check out the link in the description for more info, or stick around until the end of the video to learn more. Religion is truth putting on the dress of falsehood. Arthur Schopenhauer is primarily known for his atheistic philosophical system. But Schopenhauer is much more than his main system. Careful study of his works allows us to reconstruct a philosophy of religion. We have covered this in detail on the channel. Click the link in the description. In this video, we're going to explore three stages of encountering religion. These are successive steps which can be distilled from Schopenhauer's works as a kind of ladder, which, ideally, everyone must climb, but in reality, only the philosopher will really climb. We must never forget, Schopenhauer is an elitist, and where this subject is concerned, he is relentless. We'll tackle the three stages through the lens of one specific example, the story of Adam and Eve. Depending on the stage, the story changes meaning. The first step is the stage of blind belief in religious dogma. Schopenhauer would probably argue that 90% of people, especially in his time, are stuck at the first stage. People at this stage take religion at face value. What you see is what you get. The stories are taken literally, as if they are actual history. Thus, at this stage, the story of Adam and Eve is the literal, true history of how humankind came into being and how the world was created. God creates the world, the animals, and Adam, the first human. He is lonely, so Eve, a companion, is created from his rib. Later, a snake convinces Eve to eat from the forbidden fruit, and Adam follows. And subsequently, they are kicked out of paradise. This is the way the story has been told for millennia by priests and parents worldwide. Remember that in Schopenhauer's time, most people were dependent upon the village priests to educate them on matters concerning the Bible, especially in Catholic Europe. The Bible was this mysterious book in a strange language, Latin, which was only spoken and read by the highly educated. The job of the priest was to educate the populace. The problem, Schopenhauer argues, is that the populace is not smart enough to grasp the deeper meanings of religious texts. So the priest must simplify things, and layers of meaning and symbolism get lost in this simplification. Still, the literal interpretation of religious texts affords the masses with something they desperately need an interpretation of life. Without this, they would be lost. Just as there is popular poetry, popular wisdom in proverbs, so too there must be popular metaphysics. For mankind requires most certainly an interpretation of life, and it must be in keeping with its power of comprehension. Schopenhauer concedes that for the great plurality of people, this crude, technically incorrect way of looking at religion provides good enough scaffolding for a metaphysics that provides a guidance in our affairs and serves as a comfort and consolation in suffering and death. In short, Schopenhauer is saying that the masses can't handle the truth. But what is the truth? Before we can tackle that, we need to pass through a second stage. Stage two is the rejection of religious dogma. Not everyone buys the tales of the priests. The contradictions and absurdities which arise from a literalist view of religion cannot fool everybody. Clever minds will see through it. Sooner or later, the village priest will be confronted by someone who asks critical questions. But this is dangerous. These critical ideas cannot spread. They endanger the religion itself. In order to minimize the chances of this happening, Schopenhauer makes the argument that this is why such care is taken to teach children about religion from a very young age. In early childhood, certain fundamental views and doctrines are preached with unusual solemnity and in a manner of great earnestness, the like of which has never been seen before. Hence, it is scarcely one in many thousands that has the strength of mind to honestly and seriously ask himself, is that true? But this person, we can call him an atheist, is still operating from a literalist framework. The rejection of faith follows the confrontation with the absurdities that arise when you critically examine the stories. The story of Adam and Eve, for example, is actually the second story of creation in Genesis. The first one, with the well-known Let There Be Light and the Six Days of Creation, is different from the one in which Adam and Eve are created. This on its own is enough of a contradiction to have someone question the validity of the Bible. Subsequently, the entire Bible and the entire faith are rejected. But this is not the entire story. One stage remains. The third and final stage embraces the mystery and allegory that lies at heart of religion. 
Myth and allegory are the essential elements of religion, but under the indispensable condition, because of the intellectual limitations of the great masses, that it supplies enough satisfaction to meet those metaphysical needs of mankind which are ineradicable, and that it takes the place of pure philosophical truth, which is infinitely difficult and perhaps never attainable. Finally, we leave behind the literalist interpretations of religion. In the third and final stage, Schopenhauer invites us to look at religion from an allegorical perspective. When we do this, we can look past the absurd contradictions which arise from the literalist perspective. And we can also see why the first stage is necessary. In Schopenhauer's estimation, pure philosophical truth does exist. But it's too difficult for the masses to comprehend. It must be dressed up, made comprehensible. It must be explained in a way that is acceptable to the masses. This is the ultimate goal of religion. Religion as a vehicle for truth. Going back to the example of Adam and Eve, we can view it not as a literal history of the world, but as an allegory for why the world is as horrible as it is. You cannot go up to the average person and explain to him Schopenhauer's philosophy, explain the difference between the world as will and the world as representation, tell him all about the principium individuationis, how the world is split between objects and subjects, and how this leads to suffering. You just tell him the story of Adam and Eve, how they disobeyed God and how God punished them. That explanation is good enough. People at the first stage accept religion without questioning it. They are provided with metaphysical and ethical explanations for the world around them, which approximate the real thing. It's a good enough explanation that gets them through life, and for all intents and purposes, it's all they need. As Schopenhauer would say, not everyone can be a philosopher. He uses the example of the wooden leg. It replaces a real leg. It does a good enough job of it, but it's not a real leg. Even so, the wooden leg is of an amazing value to someone who lacks a real leg. In the second stage, people start questioning religious dogma. They ask themselves, is it all really true? And they must come to the conclusion that it is not. Religious dogma is too full of absurdities and contradictions to stand on its own legs. Following this realization, they reject religion entirely. But in the third stage, you realize that the job of religion is to communicate these real metaphysical ideas in a way that is understandable to the average person. To that end, the truth must disguise itself a little. This disguise is what we call religion, and the absurdities and contradictions are there for those who are smart enough to figure it all out. They are breadcrumbs for curious minds. The absurdities, the contradictions, in a word, the mysteries, are a way for religions to quietly admit to their own allegorical nature. The clever ones will pick up on this, while it flies over the heads of the masses. Religion fulfills the metaphysical and ethical needs of those who lack the capacity to become philosophers. It's unfair to demand of religion that it be true in a literal sense, because it was never meant to be true in a literal sense. It was always meant as a paia fraus, a noble lie. This, for Schopenhauer, represents the mature way of looking at religion. The child believes in religion at face value. The adolescent rebels against it while the adult comes to appreciate its utility and recognizes why it's needed. In conclusion, this is not to say that Schopenhauer dismisses religion out of hand. It must be stressed that for Schopenhauer, religion does lead to truth. The philosophical road to truth is hard and short. The religious road to truth, on the other hand, is long but easier. The destination, however, is the same. Thank you to Shortform for sponsoring this video. Shortform is a service I started using recently that provides in-depth book summaries. I was really impressed by how detailed the summaries were. Actually, they're not just summaries. They provide analysis and reference ideas from other books as well. For example, I've made it a personal habit to reread two of my favorite books every year. The Meditations by Marcus Aurelius and Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicolas Taleb. So I know these books inside and out, and I was impressed by the quality of Shortform's summary of them. I highly recommend checking out their service. By clicking the link in the description, you can get 5 days of free access as well as 20% off the annual subscription. So, for the price of about 1 book per month, you can get access to the main ideas of over a thousand books. And special thanks go out to our Patreons for their support of the channel. We have done a full video on Schopenhauer's philosophy of religion as well as a video on the question what lies beyond philosophy from Schopenhauer's perspective, which you might enjoy if you liked this video. With that said, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.